everyone. Good afternoon in Brussels. Good afternoon in uh, the other places of Parliament, Brussels, uh, Luxembourg and Strasbourg, and wherever you are in Europe, including Rome, Cologne, Florence, and so on. Uh, welcome to this uh, online book talk, and a particular welcome to Natalie Tocci, who is the book author we are going to talk about today. Uh, usually when we start such an event online about a book talk, I just show the book. But this time I don't show the book, simply because I read the book online, uh, and we have it in the Library of the European Parliament. The title of the book is Framing the EU Global Strategy, uh, Stronger Europe in a Fragile World and it has been published at Springer International Publishing in 2017. I'd like also to welcome uh, my colleagues, uh, Gabi Ombach, who is kind of EPRS and in the academic world, to welcome also Elena Lazarou, who is EPRS colleague from the External Policies Unit, and Joanna Appap from our Strategy and Innovation Unit. My name is Etienne Basso. I'm the director of the Members Research Service at EPRS um, and I'm going to introduce this event. I think there are two very good reasons to have Natalie Tocci to talk about her book today. The first reason is because the book, I think, is an extremely precious account of public life, of public European life. You have been uh, uh, establishing this strategy 2016. And let's look a bit backwards. The Treaty of Lisbon was adopted in 2009. And with the Treaty of Lisbon, the function of high representative vice president of commission was established. And in the same time, the parliament confirmed the first high representative, Cathy Ashton, in 2009 in the autumn. And the second uh, high representative was Federica Mogherini. She was appointed five years later in 2014. And this is really a game changer by the Treaty of Lisbon to have this high representative vice president of the commission. And it goes together with the ambition of the European Union to have a common vision of the world and to make the member states agree on common action uh, about the external world. Um, so uh, from that perspective, Natalie, I think your book is an extremely important contribution in a way already to modern history because you were writing history when you were writing this strategy in the cabinet of uh, Federica Mogherini. Uh, but it's not only uh, the reason for uh, having you with us today. Because since 2016, the world has changed a lot. And I'd like just to name a few challenges uh, that have shifted. The world has change, it has also hardened. Transatlantic relation, although there is a bit of relief now, but it has hardened. Um, we have also a big continental democracies that used to be natural partners of the European Union, such as Brazil and India, that are tempted by populism, by even authoritarianism in some cases. We have the Brexit that is getting more and more concrete uh, nowadays, just to name a few of the challenges that are going on, not even mentioning the pandemia that is going on. So I think what would be also interesting today is your reading about the current history and how things are evolving. And you are currently working for uh, High Representative Borrell. And I think it's going to be very interesting to mirror the current situation with the, the situation at the time. So the historical background and the historical account, but also the perspective and to look at the future. I stop here and I would like to uh, give uh, the moderation to Gabi Umbach. As I said, Gabi Umbach has been with us for two years in the European Parliament Research Service. Uh, as a fellow, she is uh, now part-time professor at the University Institute in Florence, the EUI Director of Global Stats. Uh, and uh, 2020 Trigger Consortium member leading global governance research. She is a non-resident visiting fellow at EPRS still and uh, managing our book talks all over the year. Um, she's adjunct professor at the Universities of Cologne and Innsbruck, book review editor of the Journal of Common Market Studies, editorial board member of the International Journal Evaluation and Program Planning, and board member of the Institute of European Politics in Berlin. So, Gabi, we are in your hand for the moderation of this event. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Etienne. Thank you for the introduction also. And um, I'm very happy to welcome you all and uh, two distinct speaker speakers to today's uh, EPRS book talk. And Natalie Tocci is director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali in, in Rome and also honorary professor at the University of Tübingen, special advisor now to Joseph Borel, as, as Etienne highlighted, and previously to um, Federica Mogherini. Uh, and the, the author of The Global Strategy, and we're very happy to hear her today. In conversation with her is Elena Lazaru, um, as, as Etienne uh, mentioned, acting head of the External Policies Unit in the Members Research Service, and uh, an expert in global governance, security and uh, defense, but also the Americas. Um, both actually, we were discussing that prior, prior to the event starting, um, both actually have their academic roots in, in, in the LSE, but also um, for uh, uh, Elena at um, the University of Cambridge, where she worked. So we have the absolute pleasure today to discuss with two um, very well-placed, well-renowned and, and well-regarded experts in the field, and I'm happy for your time. Thank you very much for that. A bit on housekeeping, we will hear um, from Natalie about the book. Um, then Elena will add a bit of contemporary context. So how do we see the global strategy today? While all of this unfolds, the chat function is open. So you are kindly invited to contribute to our discussion by raising your questions. Um, John Apap will monitor the um, chat for us and will present the questions later on to us. And we hope that we will get into a very fruitful discussion. Um, while the event unfolds. Um, the, the global strategy, the EU, the European global strategy is potentially one of the most important documents for framing the um, priorities and for strategic framing of the EU's engagement in and with the world. So of the EU's um, um, actorness in global governance, if you so wish. Um, Natalie wrote a very personal book and a personal account about the making of it and her involvement. She she always labels herself as an outside academic. I want to contest that a bit. You're actually um, an academic insider, which puts it a bit in a different context, which makes you also a, a strange animal in both worlds, which I think from my personal experience is super beneficial, but which, which gives you a particular position to reflect on the making of the strategy, not only in terms of the contents, but also in terms of the politics behind that. And that's a lot of the of the elements of what the book is about, um, that analyzes the making of the, the uh, EGS um, based on the, the European security strategy. Um, Natalie, what, what exactly do you tell us in the book and, and what why did you write it? What is what was the motivation behind it and what are your main takeaways for the audience? Well, thank you, Gabby, and let me thank Etienne, uh, you, Elena, Joanna. I mean, it's a really wonderful opportunity for me not only to be back with uh, all of you as, as uh, old, old friends and, and colleagues, um, but also to give me the opportunity to come back to this book, which, of course, uh, I wrote uh, you know, a few years ago now. Um, and, you know, as often happens with books, you know, once you write them, you kind of, you know, they're there on your shelf and you kind of forget about them. And, and so, so in preparation for this, it sort of gave me the opportunity to sort of, you know, sort of dive back into not only that, the, the book, but, but the context uh, in which it was written uh, and sort of reflect on indeed, you know, where, where we were then and, and where is it that we are now. And, and sort of let me start perhaps indeed with the motivation uh, for, for writing it back then, which in a sense is precisely the one that you were highlighting, Gabby. Um, I felt the urge to write it in a sense, really at a time in which I really couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't really afford writing it because uh, I, I wrote it straight away. You know, the, the global strategy was published in June 2016. Uh, and I submitted the manuscript, it's a short book, huh? I submitted the manuscript uh, to the publisher in December of that year. And it was not, it's not as if uh, between September and December I was kind of twiddling my thumbs in the meantime, uh, because of course that was the phase in which we began the implementation of the strategy, particularly when it came to security and defence. Uh, in particular, back then, uh, the November uh, 2016, 
uh, council conclusions uh, on the implementation plan and security and defense, which was really one of the main cornerstones, which in a sense sort of uh, established the, the, the roadmap uh, when, when, you know, as far as particularly the security and defense elements of implementation of the global strategy were concerned. But nonetheless, none, you know, although everything else was kind of happening at the same time, I felt the need to write it and to write it quickly. Uh, in order not to sort of capture, in a sense, less the rational, more the emotional uh, side of, uh, of that experience. And I felt the need to write it precisely because of this funny role that I have been in now for a number of uh, years, you know. I mean, sort of, you know, feeling that you're someone straddling different worlds. Uh, and that although often, you know, in, in that, um, sort of liminal space between academia and practice, there are many, I would say probably most on both sides of, uh, of the fence that tend to look at the other uh, in a slightly sort of, you know, derogatory way. Uh, somehow, you know, there is the, 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 the academic that looks at the practitioner as someone that just simply doesn't have certainly no theoretical knowledge or even conceptual clarity. Uh, and that is, in any case, you know, uh, politically also, uh, in a sense, sold to power. Uh, and, and then, then there is obviously all the skepticism that comes from the practitioner towards uh, the academic, uh, that basically looks at the academic as someone that just kind of lives in uh, uh, his or her ivory tower with no real, not only sense of reality, but also no real knowledge of detail. Uh, of empirical detail. Uh, and, and I would say that unfortunately, uh, this is, you know, there, there are sort of strong majorities on both sides that, that are really this way. Uh, whereas I really feel, as I think you do, Gabby, that there is real value actually in, uh, in, in straddling these two worlds. And I think um, the, the, the point about writing this book was really, uh, in a sense, sort of Natalie that had stepped into the world of practice. Uh, and, you know, I often felt like a little fly into the room looking at the way in which the machinery works, you know. But at the same time, not becoming part of that machine. You know, I was and still am a special advisor. Uh, I have uh, my day job, which is uh, that of directing a think tank, uh, which I did then and I still do now. Um, I, you know, also teach at a uh, university in, in Germany. So, you know, I, I remain anchored, it, it, it certainly and prom most prominently in the think tank world, uh, but also partly in academia. So I never felt that I was becoming a practitioner. I felt that I was an academic that entered the world of practice. And so I think that the value really lies there, you know, it is in a sense, the academic that sort of, you know, steps into the world of practice while remaining an academic, as much as I see value in the practitioner stepping into the world of academia while remaining uh, a practitioner. So that was basically, I mean, you know, to me, it was really a question of kind of paying tribute right, to an experience that I felt I was incredibly fortunate to, to have. I mean, you know, it did have a bit of side effects on my health, but that is a different story. <laughs> Um, but, 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 but at the same time, as I said, I think it was, uh, it was a wonderful opportunity and I felt that I had to give something back to it. So that was basically in a very sort of, in a sense, simple way, what, what led me to do this. And now perhaps moving a little bit to the, to the content of, uh, of the book. I mean, it's a book that in a sense traces in a rather, uh, I would say, sort of straightforward uh, manner sort of the why, the what, the how, and the what next uh, are underpinning the global strategy. And the why, I think, is probably the most important question. Uh, and this kind of reminds me of a conversation, one of the very first conversations that I had had with uh, the person who had uh, held the pen uh, of the European security strategy back in 2003, Robert Cooper, uh, and he was actually the very first person, you know, when, when sort of, you know, I discussed with Federica the uh, idea of, of, of working on the strategy and, and she agreed and sort of, you know, the, the, the process began. The very first thing I did is I phoned up Robert Cooper uh, to ask him for some advice. 
And I was struck by the fact that the very first question that he asked me was, why are you doing it? And I must admit that I hadn't really thought it through, <laughs> um, you know, beyond the very kind of obvious reason of, well, the last time was written in, two, you know, in, in 2003, and so maybe it's about time to, to do a, a, another one. And of course, you know, there obviously were reasons connected to context. Indeed, we no longer lived in a world that was so secure and prosperous and, and free as we thought it was in, in, in 2003. But that was not really the motivation for writing it. It was not really the why uh, writing uh, a new strategy. Uh, and the, the why really had to do with, I think there was both a sort of institutional and a political uh, reasons for, reason for it. And, and in a sense, underpinning both is really the idea of unity. I mean, on the institutional side, as Etienne was uh, reminding everyone, um, this was, in a sense, the sort of first strategy that was written post-Lisbon. Uh, the other strategy was lit written in the pre-Lisbon world, uh, also in the pre-enlargement uh, world. Um, and in many respects, the first uh, political institutional cycle after the Lisbon Treaty, in which, if you like, the new machinery was, uh, was established, uh, also highlighted uh, an important number of shortcomings, and shortcomings in particular in the way in which institutions work together. And so not only the relationship, for instance, between uh, the EAS and, and the Commission, the real, but the blending, if you like, of the roles of high representative and, uh, uh, and vice president. Uh, and in general, the, um, in a sense, the, the idea of European foreign policy as, let's say, a hybrid, uh, really bringing together the supranational together with the uh, intergovernmental. Um, so there was, you know, there was, there was still work to be done there. And obviously connected to this, uh, there was very much a sense of uh, we need to be more joined up institutionally. You know, it is, you know, the, 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 the traditional foreign policy, uh, sort of instruments, mechanisms, etc. So security, defense, diplomacy, um, really had to sort of work far more hand in hand together with what used to be external relations, huh? so from the trade to the development, etc. So in a sense, a strategy which was in fact called a global strategy, not for geogra not really for geographical reasons, but for, for thematic reasons, was really an attempt at bringing, in a sense, institutions together and, and therefore people together. So that's on the institutional side. Then there was obviously the political side, uh, which was again, you know, the magic word here is, is unity. I mean, you know, this was a time in which uh, disunity uh, reigned supreme uh, for reasons that at times were not connected with foreign policy at all. You know, these were sort of the years in which the fractures from the Eurozone crisis were still being uh, felt very strongly. Uh, so that you know we were divided between north and south. Then, uh, particularly after uh, 2014, with the Russian annexation uh, of Crimea, uh, destabilization of, uh, of eastern Ukraine, we were then divided in a sense east and west because it took a while for the west to kind of realize what was happening <laughs> in uh, in the east. I think today that disunity uh, is actually on that particular level has actually reduced quite quite significantly. And then, of course, we started being disunited also over migration. Uh, again, another division, you know, sort of between East and, in a sense, North and South, uh, on the, uh, in many respects, on similar, although different, uh, positions. So the idea of a document that could, um, in a sense, through the making of the document, bring uh, member states together was uh, was another key motivation which uh, drove uh, very much uh, Federica Mogherini in, in agreeing to basically uh, go ahead and do this. And then sort of turning to the what is it that, that the, the strategy really uh, argued um, and, and the book tries to, to explain. I mean this was a time in which um, it was becoming increasingly obvious that uh, indeed, the world was not so free and prosperous and, and, and secure, 
uh, and that there were sort of, you know, powers uh, around us, uh, near and far, that were acting in a increasingly, quote, you know, sort of, quote unquote, geopolitical way. I mean, it's interesting because this geopolitical word is a word that, you know, if we kind of rewind back 15 years ago, hardly anyone used. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so it really, and now, you know, it has almost become interchangeable with international relations in a way which I find terribly annoying, but this is the academic in me coming, <laughs> coming out, yeah. Um, but uh, the, the point is, I think, I think it's interesting to note that the reason why we are talking far more geopolitics is because of the hardening of the international environment uh, in, which, in which the European Union operates. Which meant that, in a sense, a, a change was inevitable. Uh, we could not simply pretend that we lived in this wonderful world in which all we had to do was uh, expand our wonderful rules, norms, and values to the rest of the world, who, in any case, hey, just wanted to become just like us. And so all we had to do was sort of magnanimously uh, lend a helping hand to help others become more, more like us. Very clearly, already by 2014, 2015, that world had obviously gone. But of course, then there was the risk, you know, there was the risk, and I think to an extent there still is the risk, of the pendulum swinging all the way to the other side. Uh, and in a sense, a union abandoning completely all of its sort of the, the normative uh, intent underpinning its foreign policy and simply trying to behave like others, you know, acting geopolitically. Uh, and I think that that, you know, sort of temptation is, is obviously still there. You know, we do have at the end of the day a commission that says it wants to be a geopolitical commission. Uh, I, I actually think that, uh, side note here, that what they mean is that they want to be a global commission. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but again, you know, it sort of speaks volumes the fact that they have decided to uh, pick on that particular term. So, you know, to, you know while working on, on, on the strategy, what we try to do and what I try and explain in the book was that in defining the priorities, be it security uh, and defense, uh, and therefore a stronger Europe, be it uh, the idea of resilience, the integrated approach uh, to conflicts and crises, uh, the uh, idea of regional cooperation, uh, as well as a global governance and sense fit for the 21st century. In each one of these goals, what we try to do is, in a sense, blend uh, not realism, uh, but, you know, sort of in the sort of IR sense of the term, but the idea of a union that was more realistic, not more realist, but more realistic, uh, in assessing the world as it is, while being driven by its principles, while being driven by its, its values. And here comes the notion of principle pragmatism, which is by far my uh, favourite, uh, and, and again, I try and explain in the book how this is really, in a sense, the philosophy that really informs the, the global strategy. Uh, and it should not be viewed as a compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, it should not be viewed as the union compromises on its values because it also has to be driven by its interests. Mm -hmm. It is really, and I think it should be understood as a union that pragmatically looks at the world as it is, removes its rose-tinted lenses, no longer looks at the world as, uh, indeed, you know, a number of countries that simply want to end up looking like the European Union itself. So it's more realistic in its assessment of the Union, but in the way in which it engages and interacts or confronts that world, it is driven by its principles, which, of course, requires the Union to live up to its principles internally. Which is why, for instance, the book also explains how in defining those underlying principles, what is as important, it is not just a question of how do we understand these principles globally, it is also how we understand them internally. So if, for instance, we're co committed to democracy, uh, what is far more important, I mean, if we're serious about promoting democracy outside, it is of fundamental importance that we live up to those standards uh, inside. 
So, you know, beyond the sort of, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of the various uh, uh, priorities of the strategy, the main contribution of the book when it comes to the what question is really trying to convey what was the underlying logic, the rationale, as I said, the sort of underlying concept of philosophy informing these, these priorities. Then I would say that, uh, because I, I realize I'm taking uh, far, far too much time already, so uh, let me just briefly say a few words on, on, on the how and the, then a few concluding uh, sort of words. Um, the how was also hugely important. I mean, at the end of the day, um, particularly when it comes to a complex entity like the European Union, it is less about the strategy and it is more about strategy making. Uh, because indeed, and here we come back to that original why question, if the point was actually that of fostering unity, you don't foster unity by producing a piece of paper. You foster unity through those interactions that actually lead to a piece of paper which is shared by different institutions, by different member states, etc. Uh, and so this was, in a sense, what made it so exhausting and why I think that uh, a strategy is something that the union can probably only afford to do once in a decade. Um, it, it, it was really a question with, you know, a, a process which lasted essentially two and a half years almost uh, that brought together member states and hey what does member states mean it means a number of different things i mean you know it means uh from uh, the political and security committee uh to engaging with capitals to political directors to secretary generals of mfas to trying to reach out to other ministries uh, uh of uh, other member states depending on the different uh, policy areas so member states mean a lot of things in and of themselves then it is about obviously engaging the Commission, it is about engaging the European Parliament. And then it is obviously about engaging, well, it's about engaging the European External Action Service, the European Defence Agency. So already at the purely official level, there is a lot of interaction going on. Then, of course, you want to make sure that this is not something which is confined to institutions, to officials, but reaches out to civil society. Uh, and indeed, if one goes to the annex uh, of the global strategy, there is a very, very long list of everyone, uh, all the different organizations from you know, NGOs to think tanks to universities, it's a couple of pages long, of uh, literally just names uh, of, of institutions that contributed. So everything from you know, uh, the Catholic Church through to, your, you know, to, to defense industry um, associations. Uh, and that was incredibly precious. Uh, and I made sure, and this is again something which I explain in the book, I made sure uh, in the strategy to actually use everything, like, you know, uh, uh, something in everything that I received. Uh, and this was actually a piece of advice that came from another uh, strategist uh, who was the author of um, the second uh, Obama uh, strategy, who had published the, I mean, so I, I met him, uh, it must have been 2015, and that um, the US strategy uh, had been published only a few months before. And this was actually a piece of, of advice that he gave me uh, when I met him. He said, you know, you'll be receiving so much input. Just make sure, if you can, uh, to use, it can only be at times a word, you know, a couple of words, but try and use something from everything. Uh, obviously, to the extent that it kind of fits into the overall picture, because that person will read the document and will find himself or herself in it. And even if maybe they would disagree with everything else, they're going to, you know, they're going to feel ownership for it, you know? I mean, they're going to feel that they would have been listened to. And I really kind of took that piece of advice at, uh, for, for, for what it was and, and really followed it through. Very final uh, sort of couple of points that, and uh, concluding points that, that I wanted to make is really about, you know, sort of what has been uh, the contribution uh, that, was, that was made. And, uh, and in a sense, you know, what is it that has changed? What is it that has not changed? What, what is it that um, should perhaps still, still change? Now, I think, uh, and this again is something that in the final part of the book I, I explain, 
so an important contribution of the strategy, I would say, unlike the 2003 strategy that didn't aim to do this, in this particular case, there was the deliberate aim to try and instill action as a consequence of, uh, uh, of the global strategy. And I think that in, in uh, fairness, uh, quite a bit of action, particularly when it comes to security and defense happened. If you take the first couple of years, I would say, uh, of implementation of the global strategy, so the sort of 2016, 2018 period, what we ended up seeing in that period was a number of instruments and mechanisms being put in place, which essentially established, if you like, the building blocks uh, of what is generally sort of thought of and, and talked about as, as a defense union. So this, I think, is in a sense tick, something that indeed did, did happen. Then I would say that um, conceptually, it, uh, it is a strategy that four years on has stuck. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this, again, is, is something that is explained in the book. Of course, the book was written uh, in, in, in 2016, not, uh, not today. But it does get into, indeed, concepts like strategic autonomy, concepts like resilience. And these are, in a sense, terms that have stuck uh, and remain, in many respects, perhaps even more pertinent today than they were back then. And this is, I think, because ultimately, although, yes, obviously, you know, the world has changed quite a lot, but I would say it has not changed in a manner that actually uh, contradicts many of these notions, it has changed in the manner that reinforces these notions. So indeed, in 2016, when we talked about resilience, we were mainly talking about the resilience of our neighbors. Now we also talk about our own resilience. Um, so in a sense, it's made that the change in context has made the concept more relevant rather than less. Indeed, in 2016, when we talked about strategic autonomy, we mainly talked about security and defense. Now when we talk about strategic autonomy, we talk about security and defense, but we also talk about digital, about climate, about energy, about the international role of the euro. But in a sense, it is because the concept has become more relevant rather than less. So yes, change in context, but in a way which in a sense has gone in the direction uh, of, of many of these concepts, which makes me personally think that so far, the, the strategy, because of its conceptual framing, has actually stood the test of time. Where I would say my, and here I will end, I know it's not nice to end on a more negative note, but I'll, I'll do that because we still have a, another 45 minutes of, uh, of discussion. Um, where I would say that uh, the, the disappointment uh, lies it is again in the Department of Action. Uh, and and here, and this is in a sense a reflection that goes beyond the book, huh? it is more about a reflection about the moment that we're living in. I think what we're seeing is that, you know, after that first moment, I would say, you know, that went more or less from 2014 through to 2018, in which there was a great deal of activism. Uh, I mean, the idea that, uh, yes, you know, we had to step up on foreign policy, we had to um, you know, sort of build our defense union. Then we basically ended up having a commission that stepped in saying, hey, it wanted to be a geopolitical commission, hooray, hooray. But what are we seeing now? And we're seeing very little action. We're seeing the temptation to fall back in, I think, something that the European Union regularly, it's a trap that it regularly falls into, which is the confusion of document production with action. You know, I think that now is not the moment to produce more documents. Now is the moment to act. There's no point trying to prepare for tomorrow's crises when we're already surrounded by crises and we are doing very little. And, you know, I, I uh, actually, I was in the European Parliament uh, and this was back in the days when we could still travel. <laughs> so it must have been maybe January or February, I can't remember, of, uh, of this year. And um, I, I was in a meeting and uh, um, uh, 
Pierre Vimont was on my, my panel and he actually said something which really stuck in my mind. You know, he, he said, well, you know, when, when ESDP began, you know, we didn't have strategies and sub-strategies and implementation plans and, uh, you know, instruments here and mechanisms there and compacts here and compasses there. But actually, if you think about it, the most ambitious missions and operations that the European Union ever conducted were in those years. So in a sense, to act, you don't really need <laughs> to have all this production of paper, you know. So yes, it is important. So now it looks like I'm arguing against myself. Yes, obviously, it is important to do it now and then. I think it's sort of, as I said, a once in a decade uh, sort of process is, is healthy. But then when we end up in this circular uh, loop of just kind of, you know, a paper that produces a new paper that produces a new paper while the world is kind of you know, crumbling to pieces around us, uh, then it becomes a, a self-referential process. So in a sense, to sort of uh, end, uh, end on these first remarks here, I would say, you know, uh, yes, an extremely valuable process, uh, I think it remains a valuable document, but let us not, uh, you know, for those of us like myself who believe in the fact that the European Union needs to have a strong role in the world, now is what I call the just do it moment. Super, thank you very much. Thanks, Natalie. Um, thank you for, for taking us through the development that actually we, we, we um, um, experience from outside, you know, the the um, concentric circles, if you so wish, of the strategic dimension and strategic discussion that the strategy initiated, um, and also pointing towards the end to something that um, I think Elena now might set a bit of context in. So where do we stand with that now? Is that document still a valid document, apart from having raised our awareness of the need to think in strategic terms? Um, and how could it lead action in important um, ways and important areas to strengthen global governance and global actorness of the EU? Elena, over to you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, good afternoon to everyone and uh, apologies for my constant movement. All my devices have failed me in a global and strategic manner. Uh, so I am here with a phone trying to put my thoughts together. So apologies. It was really interesting to listen to you, Natalie, because I have spent uh, the past few days with my iPad tape with me everywhere I go to read the book. Unfortunately, not a book since the library has not been so open and I haven't been moving these days. A very big disappointment for me. Um, but, uh, but a lot of what you said resonated with things I had thought of saying and also I was afraid I might sound a bit too academic rather than someone who works in institutions, but I guess that is the climate in which we are in this conversation today. So, so maybe I will, I will start with that caveat. Now, listening to you, thinking about the strategy, but also having been reading the book for several days, I wanted to make in the few minutes I have a few points about what I think we can learn in terms of the concepts that this strategy makes us think about, the process that led to the strategy, and the sort of actors that were involved, lessons that are useful, not necessarily in the short term, but that would inform any strategic reflection process uh, that would lead forward any multilateral organization. Uh, and I say this because there's the ongoing NATO strategic reflection process, but we're also in a moment where Admittedly, a lot of these multilateral structures are stuck and a lot of the reasons why they're stru stuck is because they're big, there's a lot of members in them, um, consensus is difficult. And I felt that in a way when you talk about the post-enlargement uh, pre-Lisbon Treaty world, you are also alluding to that, that it's a moment when the EU goes from being smaller to bigger and thus consensus needs strategy to guide it. Because as you just said, action can happen without a document, but normally when there are few actors involved and they tend to be like-minded so so i think this this is 
um, the kind of lessons you get from doing this are lessons that we can think about for any type of, of organization that is made of multiple stakeholders or actors, not necessarily like-minded. So at that moment, prioritization, guidance, a vision becomes necessary for action, uh, because let's not forget resources are always not endless. So that that's that's what really I felt was at stake at the moment when you started writing that in the way you describe the book. You know, apart from the changing geopolitical context, but but in terms of really why is this necessary? That element of political unity that is mentioned in the book of, you know, getting all the institutions on board as well as all the stakeholders. I think it's that moment of enlargement that also creates this need to have a priority, uh, a prioritization, and a strategy in order to get consensus. Um, uh, for for the way forward, and in many ways, I felt this is why you mentioned at some point in the book that a strategy is not necessarily about an action plan. It's more about a way to to move to the next day, to the future. So, so I think that's how I wanted to to. That's why my first reaction really. There's a lot of lessons there in terms of process, uh, actorship, and content for any type of strategic reflection leading to the future. Uh, now, I, 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 on concepts, I think it's important to mention here that uh, I think the strategy, and this is my sort of second point about how conceptually it changes the discussion at that moment, um, the strategy arrives at this moment where I think the academic community and policy community is reverberating and sort of talking in itself in its bubble about what kind of actorness? What kind of power is the EU? That was that decade, you know, normative power, soft power. Let's. What should we call it? And in many ways, I feel now the same thing is happening, except everyone is talking about strategic autonomy. What does it mean? So we've moved, and I think that's partly the work of the strategy, from one big conceptual debate to another big conceptual debate. Uh, and while many, myself included, will often say that we have to stop talking about what this means and actually do something, I do think that this shows that perhaps one of the most valuable elements that we can take from the strategy in the future is the shift in the conceptual debate. And even though we're talking a lot about it, it also fundamentally means that there is a change in the way the EU is perceiving itself and what it should be doing. And at this moment, I would argue that this is more about strategic autonomy than it is about normative power. But it is the normative power debate that comes before that informs the strategic autonomy conversation with this kind of approach of, yeah, but let's not forget, you know, we're not just looking for realpolitik, geopolitics and hard power at the detriment. And, and this has created this dialectic relationship in what the EU foreign policy should be that I think really comes as a legacy of this strategy. So on the conceptual level, the lesson that we can take away from this looking to the future is that these consecutive strategies are not replacing each other, but they're rather changing the debate, but being informed by what the previous debate was. And in so doing, I think that's the way that the EU's foreign policy identity is being shaped, because we are, after all, in a dynamic process. And no one really knows, I would argue, what the end game of, of this is. With regard to, to your chapter that refers to you know, who to consult and sort of the, the process of consultation and, and getting everyone to, 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 to sort of inform the strategy. I think what's really interesting is the evolution of this in the sense that um, in the think tank, on the one hand, there's the sort of non-governmental think tank dimension, and this looks very much like it evolves from sort of the think tank of the EU being involved, the EU ISS, and then opening it up to broader, broader to the academic uh, academic and think tank community, but there's also an element, and here I have to say this, of the parliament gradually being involved more, because uh, in the uh, 2003 strategy, there's hardly any parliament in there. Then in 2008, in the implementation report, it's presented to the AFID committee, but in the global strategy, it's actually the plenary that, that, that actually says, yes, we welcome this strategy. And I think this dimension as well, since we're speaking about and in the parliament right now, is, is important to see because I mean, not only does it show that as a discourse, the strategy becomes, it, the ownership of the strategy is now part of what all the institutions proclaim to do in their foreign policy activism, whether that be parliamentary diplomacy or executive diplomacy. But I think it also gives an element of legitimacy to the idea that there is there is a foreign policy. So, so I think, you know, this kind of diffusion of, of a strategy among actors um, is, is something that's necessary. And finally, because I don't want to, I, I had five minutes, right? So I don't want to take too much time. Um, but um, um, 
thinking about the future, and I think thinking about the future is always a very, very complex process because it has to do with thinking about what's happened in the past, let's say, four years under the strategy, but where are we going in the future? And of course, nowadays, there is this whole emphasis on, on strategic foresight. So what can we do in the present to think about you know, to think about the future, what kind of trends can be observed? And, and in many ways, that also has to do with, with, with what was done before. Um, so I think a few things I would keep right now, I don't want to go into the specific issue areas because I think this is beyond this conversation, but more the broader themes that I think are interesting to, to think about looking at, at what you described as process and, and what was the product of this uh, process is, if there were to be a new strategy, and I know you said you don't think so, but but were we to think that thinking of the way ahead, um, will the cleavages that that were to be addressed at the time, which were very important points in your book, and I imagine in writing the strategy, because cleavages and divisions within the EU always lead to watering down the language, and in the end, you know, I think it's important to understand exactly what they are at every moment, because they are inevitably in the end they are the ones that as i said water down the language and lead to a sort of common denominator result which even this strategy which is more ambitious than the previous ones does seem to have and correct me if i'm wrong but we see this at every council meeting we see this debates with every kind of conversation so what are the cleavages and what are the divisions i also think an important and here i would like to ask you actually because what always surprised me about this global strategy was that contrary to many other strategies the the strategy report came before the sequencing sort of the assess the threat assessment so the threat assessment is actually happening now and i do see that this is only part of the defense and security dimension but it is very customary to have a national security strategy of the united states after there's been a threat assessment exercise so i was that because of the political context or do you think that that kind of sequencing makes sense and since now we are having the strategic compass threat assess collective threat assessment exercise would that in any way change another strategy would this be a reason to have another strategy now that we will have this collective intelligence you know con consensus based product so i think that's something um to think about uh, looking forward and perhaps to end uh, since we are in in parliament which always considers itself you know apart from all this budget stuff uh, this the, the guardian of the treaty i think the, the the global strategy performed a very important task, which was to wake up the Lisbon Treaty. I mean, it's not something original to say. There's a lot that was in the Lisbon Treaty on foreign policy and wasn't implemented. But we are now 10 years after the Lisbon Treaty. We are only four years after the global strategy, but we're 10 years after the Lisbon Treaty, almost, almost 11. Is the Lisbon Treaty, did it have foresight enough to cover issues that we're facing today because arguably the global strategy did foresee you know the, the the digital the digital global order the climate issues to the extent that they are a rising china a polarized united states um, that was already kind of happening but when the treaty was was written those things were not so much there so would a next strategy were we to have one be able to reach a level of ambition based on this legal basis, or would that have to go together with something something new? And we all know how difficult it is to have treaty reform. Uh, so these are some questions I would end with, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this, but also more importantly, thank you for giving me a very explicit reason to read a book in three days, uh, which I don't do so much lately, <laughs> so thanks. Super, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Elena. For, for the very interesting um, amendments and questions. Um, Natalie, we, we, before ponging it back to you, um, actually because of something you said earlier, Natalie, and you, Elena, now mentioned the relation to the parliament and the role of the parliament in this entire process. Now, I understand, um, Etienne, if you allow me to bring you in, um, that you also could add uh, a question and a mention to discuss in, in Natalie's response now to the first round. Would you like to join immediately? Well, just uh, thank you, Gabi. It's a, it's a simple question. Um, what is striking me with, with Federica Mogherini is how she managed with the parliament. I know when we are talking about very recent history, and that is very re recent history, it's difficult to talk about personalia, but 
Um, I remember at the time, uh, Anne Marbrook was the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, uh, she was the high representative and she engaged a lot with the parliament, coming very regularly to meetings, really engaging with members. And in the end, what um, Eleni said, uh, there was an endorsement of the strategy by the parliament, not only the Foreign Affairs Committee, but the plenary. And I think this is a strategy that is really backed by the union. And, and it's also a tool now for the parliament, you know, for, for various uh, activities that we have. And, uh, uh, a sort of uh, a sort of uh, uh, a compass, if I may use the the, the word. So, I, 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 if you could talk a little bit about the person, about uh, about her engaging with the parliament and how she managed to uh, to to gain the parliament in a way. Thank you. Okay, Gabby, do you want me to uh, address some of these questions first? Yes. Um, okay, perhaps uh, let me um, let me take four. Um, firstly, uh, I wanted to come back to I think a very powerful point that Elena was 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 mentioning, um, which is uh, you know sort of you know really really this idea of um, exactly uh, a strategy is something that helps bridge cleavages question mark what would be the cleavages to be bridged in a sense with uh, with, the, with, the, with the new strategy <clears throat> and i would say that you know sometimes and here is why i come back to this question of kind of you know the the, the documents and the action sometimes indeed kind of you know talking about things and, and writing and discussing them and, and writing them down indeed sort of helps to forge a common strategic culture as a sort of you know uh, end point goal i'm not sure we're ever going to go there uh, but <laughs> i think that what is far more realistic is to work not so much on a common strategic culture but on a sense of solidarity uh, which means that we stand for one another even uh, if our threat assessments differ but that takes me to the second point that I wanted to, to make. Uh, so at times it helps in that process of kind of, you know, you, you know unifying and, and bridging cleavages. At times, I think that though when it is not substantiated by action, it tends to accentuate divisions when they don't exist. Um, and to me, it is really emblematic that, you know, all this kind of hoo-ha lately over strategic autonomy to me, tells the story of too much talk and too little action. You know, probably if we were to do strategic autonomy a little more than what we talk about, um, we would realize that there are actually not that many differences between uh, the views of the French president and the German defense minister. Uh, and maybe we actually deep down agree with the United States on what is it that we have to do as Europeans to take upon ourselves greater risk and greater responsibility. Um, the point is that we don't do this stuff, we talk about it. And by talking about it, you tend to polarize a debate, you tend to radicalize a debate. So, you know, I, I think we need to walk that fine line and understand when is it that a discussion actually helps to bridge divisions and when is it that a discussion, when it is not followed by action, accentuates those divisions. Which is why, you know, I, I come back to my skepticism as to why do this again now? Now, you know, this leads me to the to the second point about the, the strategic compass. I would say, you know, who knows, you know, this is going to take a couple of years. Uh, by the looks of it, it is going to look like a very, very, very long laundry list. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, relatively unsurprising uh, items. Mm -hmm. We kind of know uh, the way in which different member states assess different threats. And this first uh, step in, in the strategic compass does not aim to um, eliminate differences. It does not aim at coming up with one set of priority list. It, it is aimed at uh, establishing an inventory. And, you know, one can do all sorts of useful things uh, in life. Uh, let's say that this would not have been my first choice <laughs> in terms of what is it that we have to do. Now, of course, the ambition is uh, that uh, eventually from the long laundry list coming down to something a little bit shorter. 
But then I come to the point that I was hinting at earlier. I just don't think, I just don't think it's possible. And frankly speaking, I don't even think it's necessary. Um, uh, and, you know, we cannot escape the fact that we come from different geographies and different histories and different uh, political cultures. And this is the beauty about who we are. Uh, we can't erase that, you know, you will never have, I think, you know, a whatever, uh, an, an Irish woman sharing the same strategic culture as, uh, as a Frenchman. It will just not happen, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but so what, you know, does it really matter? Does it really prevent us from having a strong European Union in the world? I would say not. If we manage to work politically on, and I come back to the point about solidarity, you know, it, it doesn't matter that I don't share the same threat perception uh, as an Estonian. So long as the Estonian stands up when I feel threatened for me, and I do likewise for my Estonian uh, sort of, you know, co, co citizen of the Union. That is what I think has to be worked on politically, and that I think is actually feasible. If we understand, as I think we are beginning to understand, that in the world in which we're going to be navigating, it's either together or we're kind of all screwed. Uh, and so that, I think, is a sense of, um, of awareness which is actually growing. So, you know, coming back to the compass, who knows? Maybe, maybe I'm getting, maybe, I hope I'm wrong. You know, maybe, maybe we are going to get down to sort of, you know, 10 threats. And that is an, indeed the linear way to get to a strategy maybe in three, four, or five years' time. Uh, I would be very surprised if that happens, uh, but I would be very positively surprised because indeed, as you hinted at, it is more the way in which a state develops strategy. But um, let me say, I don't think that we're quite at the cusp of becoming a state <laughs> as, as a European Union. I think we continue to be a rather more, more complex animal. Um, which kind of brings me to your, to your third question, you know, sort of, uh, in order to really make that step change, do we need to have um, a, a treaty change? You know, I think conceptually, I, I, I realize I keep on coming back to the same answers. I think conceptually, we've kind of come as far as we can go uh, with the, you know, within the existing treaty structure. Uh, I think that we still can do a lot in terms of doing it, uh, which is always the kind of, you know, um, better way to go than, you know, sort of add, adding more possibility when you haven't even finished realizing what is it you can do with the previous possibility. So uh, I would say conceptually, yes, we've probably come to the limit. Practically, we still have a very, very, very long way to go uh, in terms of really living up to the potential of the Lisbon Treaty. Um, and, and, so, and so the sort of last uh, question is really Etienne's question about, you know, Tenerife and the European Parliament. And look, you know, what I can say on this is that really in a very, very, very genuine way, because this is something that uh, constantly came up in private conversations, you know, I mean, it was not simply doing it because it was convenient to do it. It was kind of opportunistically right to do it. It was really felt in a very strong way. Uh, engagement with Parliament was probably, I would say, her first priority. Then I would say, you know, she was, um, she understood intellectually, for instance, that uh, she really had to wear her VP hat. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is something that she, it, it came more from rationality than from, from the heart. You know, from the heart, it was really this question of engaging with Parliament because it was the right thing to do. And she kind of felt, and she always has felt at heart, that she is, is and was, you know, a parliamentarian. Um, and so this, this parliamentary dimension uh, is something that I remember from, you know, the, the moment in which uh, she was, uh, well, in fact, even before she was appointed, I mean, you know, sort of back in the summer uh, of 2014, you know, as she was beginning then, you know, after August preparing for, for the hearing, uh, she said time and time again, this is going to be, you know, I, I'm going to do it because, of course, her predecessor had not put a lot of emphasis in relations with, uh, uh, with the European Parliament. Um, and, you know, I guess, you know, partly because of her personal background as a parliamentarian, partly because of maybe her national background, 
uh, partly because of her political background, uh, as you know, someone that at heart is also a federalist, um, she really felt very strongly that this was uh, this was one of her first priorities. So I think if it kind of worked out, it worked out because it was heartfelt uh, and it was not simply uh, a rational decision, if you like. Super, thanks a lot. Natalie, um, please allow me to bring Joanna in and to, to check whether um, there are questions from the Q&A that at this point we can take in. Joanna? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, there are in fact five questions um, uh, from the Q&A um, uh, and I have grouped them a bit thematically also. So we gain, let's say, time so we can have a bit more time for the speakers to explain a bit their points because they're quite rich questions. So I've combined already uh, two questions by Antoine Ripoli, which I'll put first, and maybe I'll add to that also a question by Eamon, uh, Eamon Newman. So from Antoine Ripoli, his two questions together say, how do the panelists see the role of uh, parliaments in the years ahead in the context of a European geopolitical effort and in the making of a more geostrategic Europe? How can parliaments better contribute to the definition of the EU external policy? largely intergovernmental until now, question mark, for you to also assess that, and how to better involve also the public in the European geostrategic narrative via their representatives. So maybe uh, you take this, for because quite a lot of sub-questions, if you wish, and I'll bring to you then the next question later. So it's addressed to both of you, in fact, to Natalie and, uh, yeah, and Elena, so. Well, perhaps very, very briefly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave this to, to, to Elena. I mean, I would say that um, it is, particularly when it comes to European foreign policy, uh, so indeed, you know, it, it is this question of, of legitimacy and, and connection to the to, to the broader public. Mm -hmm. So this is, is, is really the, the, the point here. And I would say that um, what in my mind is is crucial because of course you know european citizens i mean you know they they are on the one hand um you know one doesn't really need to sort of make a strong case because the case has already been won uh in terms of supporting more europe when it comes to foreign policy not the case in other policy areas but uh it is definitely the case in in foreign policy and yet at the same time it is very difficult difficult to interest uh, citizens in foreign policy um, and you know because inevitably the agenda the, the sort of domestic political debate tends to be dominated uh, by by domestic uh, policy and, and political questions I think that a crucial role that parliaments have uh, in, in 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 European policy making sort of foreign policy making and strategy making is help make that translation you know in sort of showing how the kind of issues that citizens uh, do care about in their daily lives are actually intrinsically connected with uh, developments and dynamics happening outside uh, the European Union. Uh, and it is in making that connection uh, that I think parliaments play a crucial role in, in a translation of something which is otherwise it kind of boils off and down to a kind of odd acronym soup of NPCCs and AEDFs and strategic compasses. And I mean, you know, try and get the public interest in that, forget it, you know, uh, but try and make the public understand the way in which, you know, hey, if you're interested uh, about uh, your digital safety, as opposed to migration related issues, as opposed to employment related issues, all of these things are inextricably tied to global questions. Huh? So I think parliaments really play that incredibly important linkage function. Elena? Yes, thanks. Of course, I, I agree with what Natalie said, and I would take it a step further to say this is not only true within the EU, but it is also true of citizens outside the EU. And, and I'm speaking about parliamentary diplomacy, which is not only parliamentarians liaising with their counterparts and with governments, but also with civil society and citizens in third countries. And surprisingly, it's a very layman's thing to say, but when a member of European Parliament goes to a third country, it's 
it's much easier for citizens there to understand what the function of this person is because they don't have a commission. So a commission is an abstract concept related to the EU, but parliamentarians carry with them. It's a traditional role. And I think parliamentarian diplomacy can generate a lot of understanding about what the EU is and what is doing, not only in the EU, but of course abroad in various facets of parliamentary diplomacy. But what I'd, I'd like to add a bit is that and here I think the Lisbon Treaty had a lot of foresight without knowing so, is that the treaty gave legislative power to the parliament in many areas that were at the time mostly internal, but are now becoming fundamental parts of foreign policy. And to name a few, climate, digital regulation, um, you know, uh, these, these themselves, but even when you think about it, agricultural policy is now becoming an issue of foreign policy because what we subsidize here and what China subsidizes there, any, uh, there and it all has, implications for 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 trade so i think increasingly the way foreign policy is changing the way international security is changing it means that the european parliament and other parliaments will have more influence in what happens globally through its ability to regulate in the eu and it's not a coincidence that the brussels effect has now become a foreign policy issue as well because it means that what is legislated and regulated in the eu has an impact on the eu's global activeness and finally perhaps the budgetary role is becoming increasingly important because financing for external policy as we see in these negotiations not only because now there's a defense fund where parliament has a say but also in the way the thematic areas are, are organized for the financing of international partnerships um, and also the increasing inclusion of normative dimensions to financing you know Parliament makes sure that financing for foreign policy does, does look at human rights, does look at sustainability, does ensure you know, ethical rules for the use of autonomous weapons systems. It brings this into the conversation. Well, successfully, non-successfully, it doesn't matter. Parliament brings those issues to the table. So it brings that normative dimension back when at times the geopolitics may for a second take it away. Thank you so much. Um, as we now have to be careful with time, um, uh, we ha I will put two questions together. One is from Eamon Newman. Do you expect democracy promotion to become more or less prominent in EU external action over the next few years? And within this, is there a place in external strategy for promotion of a European style social model? And also, I will add a question by Andrea Strignitz. Is the lack of action maybe a result? It was mentioned uh, before about actions. So, is the lack of action maybe a result that may member states do not see sufficiently what needs to be preserved as added value of the union instead of a genuine European interest? The national interest perhaps prevails and blocks action. What do you think? So, please, over to you. Okay, great questions. Um, on the democracy promotion question, um, I don't know, I, I'm, not, I'm not two minds here, because I think there are two contrasting forces. Uh, on the one hand, I think that uh, we are indeed in this, you know, as, as Elena, I love the way she, she put it earlier, you know, sort of moving from one big conceptual debate to, to the other. I think we are still very, but, but one being informed by the other. Uh, I think that we're still now in that second big box. Yeah, we're not really moving into a third box uh, now, uh, and it is still a box in which it is, in a sense, sort of building up who we are more than transforming uh, others. So I think we're still there. Having said this, I also think that um, there is actually a big systemic change which is going on, which in many respects has been clarified by, by the pandemic. And it is the fact that although I, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in, in sort of Cold War analogies, I think it is increasingly clear that we are, in a sense, moving towards a crystallization of the international system uh, in which it is not going to be a classic bipolar structure as it was during the Cold War, uh, but basically uh, the other, so beyond the United States and China, the other, if you like, power centers, uh, of which uh, the European Union obviously is, is one, are going to tend, in a sense, more towards one side uh, or, or the other. Um, and I think what has clarified over the course uh, of this pandemic is that beyond the uh, different sectoral 
sets of conflicts, be it over trade, be it over digital, be it over security, there is now this, and this is what makes it Cold War-like, there is this sort of political and ideological overlay. So it is about liberalism and illiberalism, about democracy and about authoritarianism. And I, th I think it, it has become increasingly clear uh, that, uh, that, that we're moving in this direction. And of course, in this respect, we very much, we as Europeans, very much, in a sense, belong to one camp. Um, and, and yes, it is about living up to those values internally, but it, the minute in which you understand yourself as belonging to one camp, inevitably it will come again to inform the way in which you interact with outside, which is what makes me think uh, that indeed, you know, coming back to Elena's point, it is about the old narrative informing, uh, informing the new one. Um, and then on the action question, you know, why is it that we're not acting? Is it because, you know, sort of member states don't see the, the, the in a sense, the need for European action at European level? I think actually the main problem, uh, because I don't see much action at member state level either, frankly speaking. Uh, so I think the main problem is that we still are kind of all waiting for Godot, and Godot being the United States of America. Uh, in somehow um, wanting to, you know, sort of not really wanting to believe the fact that we now live in a different world. Uh, and that, you know, even if Joe Biden uh, has been thankfully elected uh, as president of the United States, we're not going to go back to the 1990s, you know, because even in Obama days, you know, this was this was the leading from behind uh, kind of era, you know, this was we're moving towards a world in which the United States is still obviously going to be a, a global leader, but it will be mainly preoccupied with its own priorities, right? and it will increasingly expect Europeans to stand on, uh, on on their own feet. But but I think that we are we kind of understand this maybe intellectually, but we're not there in terms of, of really acting upon this understanding. And so, of course, the consequence is that. We see, you know, Turkey and Russia hand in hand, uh, together with other regional powers, kind of acting uh, in and around us for the simple reason that we're not. Uh, and we're there waiting for the United States to do something, but the United States will not. <laughs> and the sooner we come to this realization, be it at EU level or at member state level, the better it's going to be. Great. Okay. Elena, shall I put the next questions? What do you think? You want to come in on this? Um, I think that since people have the the great privilege of working with me, most of the people who are attending and are in Parliament, maybe they I don't need to to come in on this and give them the privilege, actually the bigger privilege of asking questions and that's me to reply because she's not here as often as I am. So I'm happy to to have more questions. Thank you, Lenny. Um, now I have three questions and we'll stop with these questions. So we'll finish on these. These questions are more addressing the what now what natalie mentioned like there was one of her kind of parts of the presentation the last part was what now and i would say also where to because there are questions on specifically addressing to regions our relations with certain regions and specific policy areas so we have a question from alejandra ramirez the concept of the open strategic uh, autonomy currently it is a concept deep, deeply linked to trade policy china has become a major geopolitical player what should be the role of the EU to strengthen its role as a global leader under that context? That's about geopolitics and trade policy with respect to open strategic autonomy. Then question on which one country or region will be Europe's best friend over the next decade, according to you. So a crystal ball here to look at that. And finally, um, a question by Frederic is to what extent do you think food security issues were taken into consideration so at the moment when uh, the book was being prepared was it coherent so uh, with the importance of the common agricultural policy in EU history so the consideration about food security issues and uh, with so with the blocking of multilateralism multilateralism in 2008 on food security issues and with the central place that food uh, uh, plays so in terms of security for rich countries like us, or was this uh, perhaps a blind spot that could confirm there for your analysis, Natalie, especially about the lack of action taken therefore so far by the EU and, uh, and regarding also plenty of 
other related discourses. So, and he says many thanks so, to talk also how this fits with strategic autonomy. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, so let me begin with Alejandra's question on, uh, on strategic autonomy and, and, and China and trade in particular. I mean, I think here as, as Europeans, we're really faced with a conundrum because, I mean, essentially, what, well, one interpretation of strategic autonomy is um, reducing, uh, either reducing dependences uh, or reducing asymmetric uh, interdependencies. There were, be it dependencies or asymmetric interdependencies are used and abused by external powers uh, to uh, interfere with our rules, norms, uh, blah, blah, blah. Now, of course, you know, this relates to Russia, it relates to the United States, if we think secondary sanctions, for instance, but it also obviously relates to, to China. But with China, we're, I think we're faced with, with, with a very, uh, as I said, with a conundrum. Because what we say to China is, hey, you know, we have to level the playing field. And we say it, and we say it again, and then we say it one more time. Uh, and then this level play, this playing field is not being leveled at all. Um, and if we do want, and of course our ambition is to level the playing field, and it has been our ambition for years, to level the playing field up, meaning that China liberalizes. But if China does not liberalize, and, and if we do want to level the playing field, what are the implications? Do we have to level the playing field down? Which brings us to the question of protectionism, you know. Uh, in order to reduce uh, asymmetric dependencies, or, you know, interdependencies or dependencies, do we have to accept a degree of closure? I don't have an answer to that question, uh, but I do think that it's a question that has to be posed uh, also in these terms. Uh, because, you know, and it relates to what should our state aid policy be? I mean, you know, what should uh, our approach to, you know, should we be fostering European champions? I mean, it gets us to this kind of the, uh, of the debate, but it's kind of premised on the acknowledgement, it goes back to the being realistic, huh? not realist, but realistic, that much as we would like the rest of the world to be like us, if it doesn't, we have to kind of think about the consequences and think about, you know, and make at times difficult and at times painful choices. So I think, as I said, I don't have an answer as to how we should do it, but I think we should start talking about it also in, in these terms. As to which country is going to be our best friend, well, the country that should obviously continue to be our best friend uh, is, and I'm, you know, I'm not being particularly original here, uh, the United States, uh, for the simple reason that indeed if we are moving in, you know, in a world, and we are going to be navigating in a world in which um, liberal democracies are going to be uh, sort of pitted side by side and at times against illiberal uh, countries, inevitably the United States is going to be the first and will continue to be the first uh, port of call. And let me say that as we move towards this form of international system, it is going to be in many respects a far more difficult predicament that we were in during the Cold War. Uh, because let's face it, during the Cold War, there was never really a question as to what was the better political system. You know, where is it you could have the better political life? Um, you know, maybe, maybe in the first decade or so during the Cold War, but frankly speaking, I mean, you know, it was then obviously a very uh, acute confrontation in the nuclear realm, but not really in terms of, you know, where is it that, you know, one would rather live? When now that it comes to China, um, we may, you know, have a clear answer to that question. But so far, for instance, we've been proven wrong that political freedoms and economic prosperity necessarily go hand in hand. This is something that we said, you know, and repeated many times, but so far we have been proven wrong. Uh, we may be proven wrong in terms of what political system is better equipped to deal with a global pandemic. <laughs> this is, again, you know, something that we're struggling with at the moment, which doesn't mean to say that we're losing and we will lose the argument. It just simply means to say that it is a more difficult argument to win uh, and therefore joining hands with other liberal democracies 
uh, of which the United States will continue uh, to be uh, sort of, you know, first, first and foremost, I think is going to be uh, crucially important. And then finally, on, uh, on food security, I, you know, I think in all honesty, it is not something that we paid enough attention to uh, in, uh, in the global strategy. Um, I think the global strategy sort of uh, made, again, it, it, it's this question of, you know, uh, things that were, in a sense, seeds that were planted uh, and that now have developed further. So I think, you know, the global strategy certainly uh, put questions of sustainability and climate sort of front and center. Of course, again, you know, context matters. You know, this was uh, the strategy was published what nine months after the SDGs were were approved, huh? so it kind of made a big deal of of uh, of the SDGs, uh, but less specifically about food security in a manner in which again the context today proves and has shown us to be far more important than what we realised four years ago. Is food security something that is in contrast with that philosophy? No, it's something that substantiates it uh, further. I think. Thank you so much, Nathalie. Eleni, any final comments? On the friends question, I also, I mean, I completely think, you know, our best friend is still the same as, as he, she was. But I also think we should really make a big effort to become very good friends with our former spouse, because I think um, the United Kingdom, um, you know, if you take the surface away, look at the way they feel about the JCPOA, um, about 5G, about climate, about you know, you name it. Uh, and we already have very similar regulatory processes established. So I think it, you know, the United Kingdom should definitely be a list of on the list of very good friends. And if I may say so, I think the way ahead is kind of like a person who has many lives in different countries. If they've studied here and worked there and been from somewhere, you have a best friend everywhere you go, you know, and this is how it should be. Climate, you have a friend, trade, you have a friend, maybe not the same friend, but you need to have, that's how the, how the world is going to work. On food security, and here, you know, I'm going to be more, um, I will think the global strategy had more foresight than Natalie attributes to it or takes claim from, because by putting the SDGs in there, I think, I think it opened the way for many synergies or made many ways, many things to do on many issues of which food security is one. For example, we don't think about it, but one of the naval CSDP operations is helping the World Food Programme take food to Africa. Now, on multilateralism, food is a big issue. So I think you know, it doesn't need to be there explicitly to to be something that was addressed. Um, so so I think this is going to be my final comment. And um, thank you very much, Natalie. It's been great for me to listen to you too, as for everyone here. Thank you so much for your excellent comments. And I pass the floor back now to Gavi and to Etienne for closing. Super, thank you very much. And also in, in light of this, the, the time, a, a very, very warm thank you to both of you, Natalie and Elena for showing us the importance and the relevance of conceptual reflection to open up corridors of action um, and to make us understand that we're still in the process, that although a strategy might have been in place for, for a certain period of time, there's no horizon for revision, be it contractual treaty revision of the, of the strategy, that it opens up um, um, rooms um, in which we can further develop the discourse. With that, um, I, for me personally, wish you very, very happy holidays and hand over to Etienne. I'm looking forward to the next book talk that we will have next year. Etienne, over to you. Thanks to the two speakers and to Joanna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabi. Thank you, everyone. I think we, we covered a lot of ground and we, I'm sure, have many, many takeaways uh, for all of us uh, about the, the discussion. I'd just like to, to flag two points. Um, I think uh, that, that was said very clearly in the discussion that um, Although we don't know if there will be an update or not of the strategy, and the parliament is actually in favor of, of, of kind of uh, updating the strategy, but it's clear that uh, the things that were flagged up in 2016 are extremely relevant still today. And uh, from that perspective, the strategy was visionary uh, and is, is still extremely relevant for our uh, research for resilience today. The second point is about the Lisbon Treaty itself. I strongly believe that there is still a very high untapped potential in the Lisbon Treaty uh, on various fronts, including on the Foreign Affairs front, 
PESCO, a lot of things uh, that can be done. Uh, we have seen also uh, very recently the recovery plan, something that was not thinkable a year ago, and it happened. So I think there is a very large room there. We don't know if the conference on the future of Europe that uh, will open soon will look at the treaty change, but I think we should also look at the untapped potential and try to be creative on how this untapped potential can be uh, activated. Uh, this was our last book talk in 2020. So first of all, I'd like to encourage you to read the book, to buy it. It's Christmas, so it's a perfect time to uh, buy such a book and to take the time to read it in this uh, recess we're going to have. Uh, we had in 2020, uh, 2029 book talks online. It was completely new for APRS, but I think it's a great success and I'm happy that we could do it. I'd like to thank Nathalie. I'd like to thank Gabby. Eleni Joanna and also behind the scene, and Cécile Charrier, that is behind this grey um, uh, square that you see on your screen and that managed successfully the techniques behind this. Our next book talk will be, uh, and the first one in 2021 will be with uh, Bob uh, Zolik uh, on his uh, book, America in the World, A History of US Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. The exact date is not yet known but it will be confirmed shortly. So with this, I finish this uh, conversation. Thank you very much to all of you and uh, Merry Christmas. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.